Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, sorry, it took us a couple minutes to get started, but we will jump right into it now. My name is Alexis Goldsmith, and I am a resident of North Central Troy, and I have been an independent journalist with the Sanctuary for Independent Media for two years now. Um, I'm going to moderate this press conference and I'm gonna open with a brief land acknowledgement. It is with gratitude and humility that I acknowledge that the land upon which we live resides upon the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people who are indigenous peoples of the lands of New York. Despite tremendous hardships and being forced from their lands, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. I pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as I commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. So good morning. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Judith Eng, who is the former EPA regional administrator. And that is spelled J-U-D-I-T-H-E-N-C-K. Judith, and you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> You think I'd know this by now. Good morning, everyone. I'm Judith Ank. Um, I'm one of three speakers this morning that you'll hear from. I live in Rensselaer County and I served as EPA regional administrator during the Obama administration. Uh, I was the top federal environmental regulator for New York, New Jersey, eight Indian nations in New York, Puerto Rico, and the US Virgin Islands. I wanna provide a little bit of context on what we're talking about this morning. Uh, Norlite is a hazardous waste incinerator located in the city of Cohoes in a densely populated area. It is just a few hundred yards from Saratoga Sites, which is a public housing complex where over 70 families live. Uh, appropriately, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation has designated this area an environmental justice area. Uh, the prevailing winds take the air pollution from Norlite, uh, not just impacting Cohoes, but also to the east, uh, where it affects the city of Troy, Rensselaer County, um, and it is very close to both the Hudson and the Mohawk Rivers. Norlite uh, has a mining operation on site. They mine shale. They take the shale, they put it in a kiln where it's heated at high temperature, in order to create something called aggregate. If you drive by on Route 7, you see these growing large piles of a very fine material, almost like sand, that sand that's used in construction. Um, this facility could easily operate by burning natural gas, which is what they did for a large part of, of recent memory. However, they don't often now burn natural gas. They burn hazardous waste that is brought in from all over the country. They do that because they get paid to burn hazardous waste from all over the country. Um, I have known about the class of chemicals called PFAS for many years, including at my time at the EPA, when we learned that PFAS or PFAS chemicals were contaminating the public water supply in Hoosick Falls, New York and Petersburg, New York. The good news here is that there's no evidence that PFAS chemicals have affected the water supply in Cohoes. It is safe. However, there is evidence of serious concern about airborne exposure to PFAS chemicals. Um, PFAS chemicals are very, very toxic. In 2012, there was a comprehensive report looking at PFAS exposure in Ohio and West Virginia, again, through drinking water. And uh, the researchers found probable links to kidney cancer, testicular cancer, ulcerative colitis, thyroid disease, pregnancy-induced hypertension, and high cholesterol. PFAS chemicals pose serious health risks. What we don't know is precisely what happens when you breathe them in, because it is highly unusual to burn PFAS chemicals. Just about a year ago, 
um, I received a phone call from an environmental advocate in California, Jane Williams, who had submitted a freedom of information request to the US Department of Defense. Department of Defense had signed a contract with Norlite and other incinerators around the country to burn toxic firefighting foam, which is known as AFFF, and which contains PFAS chemicals. I was told that large amounts of toxic firefighting foam had been trucked to Norlite and burned. When I heard this, I was absolutely stunned. And I thought, this couldn't possibly be true. There is no evidence that it's safe to burn uh, AFFF. By definition, AFFF is a fire suppressant. It does not burn well. And there's no evident evidence at all that when it is burned at an incinerator, that it's completely destroyed. If it's not completely destroyed, that means it becomes airborne. It exposes people through the air, builds up in soil, builds up in water. Now we're dealing with Norlite. Norlite has a very long history of violating environmental laws. In fact, if you go to the DEC webpage, you will see a very helpful document, which is the Norlite enforcement history over 30 years. You go page after page after page of very serious environmental violations. And just last May, the federal EPA settled a serious enforcement case with Norlite showing real problems with their operation. So I was surprised to learn that um, Norlite was burning toxic firefighting foam, but shockingly, it turned out to be true. They have burned a minimum of over 2 million pounds of toxic firefighting foam containing PFAS chemicals in 2018 and 2019 in the city of Cohoes next to a public housing complex. We learned this right after Mayor Bill Keeler became mayor of Cohoes, and he has been doing an admirable job working to protect his constituents from this health risk. But just like the public, important information was missing. Norlite introduced this new toxic waste stream to be burned without telling anyone, without telling local public officials, without telling the public. At least that's what we thought at the time. What we've now learned through responses from the Freedom of Information Law is that at least two high-ranking officials at the DEC knew that Norlite was burning uh, toxic firefighting foam, which they did not have permission to do. The two That's most cool. important people that are entrusted with protecting public health at this facility are the DEC on-site monitor and the DEC regional director. Those were the two people who knew as early as March 2019 that this incineration of PFAS chemicals was happening. Yet the DEC as an agency has consistently said to the public that they did not know that Norlite was burning this until late 2019. And as soon as they found out, they directed Norlite to stop. This timeline is not true. Through this FOIL request, we know that Keith Gertz was in direct contact with Norlite about burning PFAS. Specifically, he was in direct contact with Norlite's parent company, Trade Bee. Um, there is an exchange of emails that are very troubling. Not only did Keith Gertz know this, he also was coaching Norlite, urging them to attend an important conference at SUNY Albany on AFFF and PFAS issues. 
The deeper issue is that he stood by and watched his agency consistently say that they didn't know about this until late 2019, when we have emails exchanges now of him communicating with Norlight about this as early as March. This is significant. This is not just keeping track of paperwork. This is significant because we appreciate that DEC said when they found out that this burning was happening, they told Norlight to stop. They could have told Norlight almost a year earlier. And if they had done that, it would have prevented thousands of people from being exposed to a highly toxic chemical. In my view, DEC is either unwilling or unable to regulate this facility and protect public health. Perhaps it's both. This is an environmental justice issue. I've long maintained that if Norlight was in a more affluent neighborhood, it would have been shut down years ago. This morning, a letter was sent to the New York State Inspector General and also to the DEC Office of Internal Investigation. We know that Keith Gertz, the top regulator at the DEC office, retired about a month or so ago. That's no reason not to investigate him. We also know that the DEC on-site monitor was removed from Norlight, but we don't know what other facility he's been assigned to to provide on-site monitor responsibilities. That's important to know because this gentleman spent 15 years turning away from the serious problems at Norlight. So we are calling on the inspector general to investigate not only these two individuals, but how is it possible for an important state agency like DEC to tell the public they didn't know about this until late 2019 when Gertz knew perhaps a year earlier. The Cuomo administration runs a tight ship. People don't freelance. Um, I doubt Keith Dirt Gertz didn't tell anyone else. I doubt the on-site monitor didn't tell anyone else. But what's tremendously troubling is that months and months of added pollution and potential exposure to PFAS chemicals took place while the public was told an entirely different story. Joe Ritchie um, will now go into some detail about the Freedom of Information Act response in the emails. Thank you, Judith. Um, so I'll int quickly introduce Joe. Joe is a 20 year resident of Saratoga Sites. His family still lives there. He is now the executive director of Saratoga Sites Against Norlight Emissions, a new nonprofit. And he's also a junior at Syracuse University studying environmental policy. Joe, you can unmute yourself. Thanks, Alexis, and thanks, Judith. Um, first off, I'd just like to say thanks, everyone, for attending today. Um, I think it really speaks volume to the issue that we're talking about. Um, before I start talking and get on with my little spiel, I'm going to share you guys a little um, the email exchange that was, you know, between the top ranking region for um, DEC official and with a official from Norlight. So just give me one moment so, until I share my screen. And please let me know if you see it. Yep. Great. Well, first off, I think you guys can see something pretty obvious. Um, a highly redacted um, document that was given as a foil. Probably very vital information here that we'll never know. So this exchange is from Tita Lagrimas. She is a worker at Tradeby to Keith Gertz. This first exchange with the CC of Victoria Schmidt from also from DEC. It says, thank you for taking the time to speak with me. I look forward to receiving any information you can share. Sergio Prince and myself will call you next week. Tita from Trade to B. 
And then it says, good evening. I'm sorry, good morning, Tita. The University of Albany will be presenting the attached on Thursday at the ACS national meeting. Also, as we discussed, I would like to see some sampling information performed on the air discharge and the wastewater discharge during the thermal destruction of AFFF firefighting foam at your facility. The purpose of this is to verify that the total destruction of PFAS is accomplished during incineration. There are so few effective ways in which to manage this waste. It would be great to show that incineration is a viable option. Thank you, Keith. New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, Regional Director of Region 4. And then as I just read uh, the late email, thank you for letting us know about this. We'll take it back to the team and we'll talk about it. Um, so clearly they knew about this the whole time. And clearly they lied to the public. Um, and that is just, I want to say unfortunate, but it's almost unexpected because from the very beginning, activists such as myself and people who have been putting a lot of hard work on this issue have been discounted and discredited and belittled by both Norla and the DEC. Belittled? So that is why we are calling on the Inspector General of New York State and the Inspector General of the DEC to investigate Keith Gertz and also the on-site monitor, Joe Hattersbeck for the complete, I won't say incompetence, I'll say corrupt ways in which they were acting because they put the residents of Saratoga sites, my family at risk. They told that they didn't know about this. When we first started, when I first started talking to the DEC, they told me they had no idea this stuff was happening. And then the narrative changes as, as time goes on. But I was told face-to-face -to from high-ranking DEC officials that they had no idea that this stuff ever happened, that it was just a lone wolf of Joe Hatter's back. I don't believe that for one bit. I didn't believe that then. And clearly I do not believe that now. The public health of Saratoga sites, Cohoes, Troy, the surrounding area, which is 50,000 plus people were put at jeopardy from this horrible, horrible chemicals, AFFF, the PFAS contaminants. I mean, that's just the icing on the cake, but we also have the issues with the silica dust. We also have the issues with the awful smells. Um, just this past week, my mom was outside and she was trying to get, um, she was cleaning off the car and she kept coughing at how awful the smell was. She could not breathe. She could not breathe. Now, my mom doesn't have any pre-existing conditions. If that was my grandmother outside with, with end-stage COPD, I don't think that would have been great for her. Money does not have a value over the people who live at Saratoga sites in Cohoes, in New York State in general. The DEC needs to step up and they need to protect the residents permanently this facility should not be operating the way it is. If you go back to the 1990s, you'll find, and this is just the 90s, they've been in operation since the 50s, I believe, violations for fugitive dust, for smells, for everything that we're complaining about today. The EC has put out enforcement actions, but they clearly do not work. This company has the money to fund these violations. They're a multinational company and we're letting them pollute our area. 70 residents of Saratoga sites have to move out because it's dangerous for them to be living there, but Norlite's allowed to stay there. Something's not right. Something isn't right. I've dedicated my whole life to Cohoes, New York. Norlite has dedicated their whole life to Tradeby and to their other companies that they've lived for. I've lived in Cohoes my whole life. I deserve to stay where I live. They deserve to leave. It is just unfathomable that we have to be talking about this today. We are calling on the inspector general to inspect these people for their just ineptness. They do not know what they were doing and they should not 
be holding any other positions in the future with the DEC when it comes to the public health of the citizens of New York State. It's time to wake up. It's time to smell the roses. It's time to go outside and smell Norlite and to say that we really need to get a solution here because people are literally dying here. This is a life or death situation. And I hate to sound like an alarmist, but I've seen it. I've seen my family, my friends, my neighbors just get sick, get these diseases that people don't get normally. So I'll leave, it at, I'll leave you with this. Why is it that the residents of Saratoga sites have to leave while this facility is allowed to stay and make millions of dollars a year? I don't know. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And our last speaker today is Chris Savinsky. He is a PhD biochemist with a background in cancer research. He lives 4,000 feet from Norlite with his wife and his four children. Chris? Hi, thank you, Alexis. And thank you, Judith and Joe, for great presentations and great comments. I agree with everything you said. Um, thanks, everybody, for your attention today. Thanks for participating in, in this news conference. Um, as Alexa said, I'm, I've got a background in cancer biology, cancer research, and uh, what I know about Norlite has, is, is troubling uh, from that professional standpoint. I also am raising four kids, 4,000 feet uh, from Norlite, along with my wife, and uh, I have deep concerns for, for, their, for their health. Um, and um, this only underscores you know, my concerns that our, our public regulators are unfortunately um, not always acting in our best interest. Uh, so, you know, the revelation that Norlite was burning huge quantities of PFAS containing aqueous film forming uh, firefighting foam in 2018 and 2019 has, has really led to far more questions than answers. Uh, the New York State DEC, you know, they're charged with protecting the, the health of both the people and the environment. But as you just heard, senior officials at the DEC, including Keith Gertz, the top <laughs> official of Region 4, were aware that Norlite was burning large quantities of this toxic compound long before it was known to the public and before they had previously acknowledged it's totally unacceptable. This is a scandal. Why? Why is it a scandal? Because at the time, as it remains today, the scientific consensus holds that it is unsafe to burn this material in large scale hazardous waste incinerators. You know, the rest of the redacted email, I'd love to see it, but the tone of the, that which we could read from the Region 4 administrator suggests that he was not only familiar with the activities, you know, that burnt, the PFAS was being burned there, um, but also that the, the process has not been proven safe yet uh, and, and was still supportive of the burn. You know, this is an unforgivable breach of public trust, you know, that must be restored by the current DEC, DEC administration. Now, the people living near Norlite, like Joe and my kids, should never have been test subjects in an ill-conceived and dangerous science experiment. Uh, you know, the former on-site monitor, Joe Hattersbeck, who reported to Gertz, you know, has made cavalier statements dismissing the risk to the public and certainly knew that the burn was occurring. We still don't know where he is currently assigned. Is he overseeing another dangerous operation? Who knows? We can't get an answer to that. You know, this pattern of collusion with Norlite to enable risky experimentation with human lives needs to be fully investigated with full transparency to the public. So I'm repeating that call to the New York State Inspector General to open an investigation into the actions of Gertz and Hattersback and for the DEC to restore public trust by shutting this site down until it can be deemed safe to the public, which it's gonna be a lot of work to do that. And working more transparently with the public in the process of evaluating Norlite's right to operate. Now, much work is required to re reestablish this public trust um, you know, the recent enforcement actions are, are welcome, but more needs to be done. So thank you for your time today. Thank you, Chris. So um, we'll open it up to questions from reporters and then I'll get any final words from the speakers. And then we have a short video to sum up the information that we presented today. So any questions from reporters, please feel free to unmute yourself, but um, please reporters only. Hi, I have a uh, Tyler McNeil, Omni Proper. I have a bundle, but I'm going to try to keep it to uh, just, I mean, at least as little as possible. Um, so are you going to appeal the redactions? Uh, maybe Philip Oswald can answer that. Phil, could you introduce yourself briefly? And you're muted. Sure, thanks, Alexa. Yeah, I can address that briefly. Um, 
We, uh, I'm, my name is Phil Oswald. I'm an attorney, uh, environmental attorney with the firm Rupp Boss. Been helping uh, Joe out and his organization um, and trying to hold Norlight accountable as well as the DEC. Um, we made, my office made the FOIL request that uh, initially generated the, uh, the uh, response. We did appeal it, which is when the email that we've all been talking about was disclosed. Uh, so the next step would be an Article 78 proceeding. And uh, we're still uh, evaluating that right now. Uh, we do have several other FOIA requests outstanding. So I just wanna put a finer point on that. Um, um, Attorney Oswald got a stack of information, but he did not receive these emails when he did his first Freedom of Information request. He appealed and got these emails on appeal. Yeah. Um, what, what Joe told me beforehand, he said that there, that, um, the, the intent to sue Lor, uh, Norlight, there was some, um, trouble with the first, um, uh, uh, file to, I'm just messing up my words here, but, um, so that lawsuit didn't go through, but he's considering, I, I believe a second lawsuit that would actually, you know, um, take care of some of the stuff that didn't go through the first time? Is that true? Joe or Phil, do you want to answer that? Or, you know, talk about the, the letter to the Attorney General sent this morning? I think so, maybe. The... Go ahead, Joe. No, I'm sorry, could you just re repeat the question real quick? Yeah, I, I'm exactly follow that. <laughs> sorry about that. The first, um, uh, when you filed to um, intend to sue last June, uh, that didn't that didn't exactly turn into a lawsuit itself uh, because the, I heard that there were some problems with it. Um, are, is there going to be now a, a second lawsuit? There's some people that I've talked to in the community that believe that there's a current lawsuit that's ongoing and um i've heard that there isn't exactly sure so the the first intent to sue uh letter was sent uh as a requirement under several federal laws that we were uh going to sue under um when the governor signed the legislation uh prohibiting the incineration of a triple f um that uh really for the most part uh mooted that particular lawsuit under those federal laws as it was uh, outlined in the initial letter of intent to sue in June. Um, we're always looking at uh, what Norlight is doing, what the DC, DEC is doing, or more uh, importantly is not doing. Um, <clears throat> but I can't, uh, I can't speak specifically as to future litigation. I will also note that there, there was another letter of intent to sue that was sent at the end of September of 2020 um, for some other violations. And that is, is still in play, but a lawsuit has not yet been filed. Okay. Um, so on the, there, there was the fourth note um, within the press release that came out uh, at, and everything seemed to make sense. The, the one thing that I would say that I would say to that though, does that necessary um, does that necessarily equal uh, ch chummy per se? I want to hear uh, a little bit more about the the chummy aspect of that because um, it it is kind of a subjective phrase. I think Judith knows this a little bit going. I mean, as far back as the eighties with with Nyberg and um, you know before that knows a lot about everything about the DEC and. Um, uh, nor light in that aspect. Well, I, I think the important thing is the dates. Um, if you look at the um, article that's attached to the letter to the inspector general that appeared um, written by Lee Harris in New York Focus and also city and state, it says that the on-site coordinator Hattersback knew that the toxic firefighting foam was being burned in 2018. And then um, the DEC put out numerous public statements that they didn't know until late 2019. And now we have this freedom of information request 
provided document saying that the top regulator in the DEC regional office was emailing with the Norlight parent company in March of 2019. The significance of that is it appears that Mr. Gertz is um, urging uh, Norlight and their parent company Trader B to attend a local conference, uh, sending them the conference announcement, helping to facilitate them having uh, that information. But most importantly, I want to explain how the law is supposed to work. If Norlight wanted to introduce the burning of a whole new universe of waste, which they did, toxic firefighting foam that contains PFAS, the way environmental law works is they should apply to the state DEC to get uh, permission to do this. And the DEC would have required them to do test burns to see that when you introduce this new material, is it causing violations of your permit? Instead of that typical process that the law requires unfolding, you have this email exchange where Keith Gertz says, as we've discussed, I'd like to see some sampling performed on the air discharges and the wastewater discharge during thermal destruction of a triple F. I don't know if that ever happened. And it's highly unusual to request that in an informal email. Further, and the most important line in this email is when Gertz says, there are so few effective ways in which to manage this waste. It would be great to show that incineration is a viable option. He knew that the incineration was taking place next to a public housing complex for well over a year and that it's unproven. The people of Cohoes and Troy and Rensselaer County should not be guinea pigs in deciding whether or not this is a viable option. This is not how environmental regulation is supposed to work. Maybe we can go on to a few other reporters and Tyler, we're happy to talk to you further after the Zoom. Sounds good. Any further questions? Um, just unmute yourself. Hi, this is Peter Mantius. Um, is there any more information on um, the, uh, the regional director who uh, apparently retired about a month ago? Um, what, give us some more information on how long he was in that position and any circumstances around his retirement. Um, I think he was in the position, correct me if anyone knows differently, maybe about four or five years. It's the top position in the regional office of DEC. Um, and I don't know what he's doing now. Um, he retired in 2014. I'm, I, I'm sorry, he's, he's been in the position since 2014. And he retired January 1st or December 31st. And we don't know what he's doing now by virtue of the fact of him leaving that position doesn't mean that he should not be investigating, investigated by the inspector general for misleading the public and um, astonishingly sitting by while his agency uh, consistently said they did not know about the burning until late 2019. And when they learned about it, they ordered Norlight to stop. Well, what, what was going on from March of 2019 to the end of 2019? Uh, did he just wash, wash the, uh, view these public statements consistently and decide not to correct the record? We don't know. That's why it needs to be investigated. Does anyone know his background before he, he uh, had that position, got the position of district uh, supervisor and, and how old he is? Regional, oh. direct, regional director, and I, he, his career prior to serving as regional director, at least for a period of time, was within DEC, but I don't know more than that. And I would just like to add, too, when this issue first arose back almost a year ago today, Valentine's Day, um, I, I gave Keith Gertz a call myself when this first started. Um, he told me that he was an engineer um, and that they found out late 2019. I mean, I had a verbal conversation with this guy 
And yet, I don't think he was misleading me. He was lying to me. Um, so, and he was so pro incineration of this material in a low income area. I mean, I don't, I, you're just not supposed to do that. It's just highly inappropriate. Any more questions? Then we'll go to final statements and we have a short video. Okay, well, if there are no further questions, then uh, I'd invite our uh, speakers to make any final statements. And um, just a reminder that the press release with the letter to the eternal attorney general, sorry, the letter to the inspector general and all attachments uh, was sent to reporters. If you didn't receive it, please just message me in the chat um, or send an email to Mark Dunley and we will get that to you. Joe? Yeah, I would just like to say one thing and that is I really hope, well not hope, but these emails really undermine the transparency process DEC has been touting over this last year. If you go to any info session that the DEC has held um, virtually the past few months, they'll keep saying we've been transparent, we've been transparent, we've been transparent. It's not true. They haven't been transparent. They're hiding things. Um, when we foil things, it takes months, sometimes half a year to get what we need. And they attack us at every single level. So they haven't been transparent with us. They've lied to us. And they are pro Norlite. They're not pro Cohoes. They're not pro New York. They're being pro industry. And we need to change that within this, within the DEC, because people's lives are at risk. Thanks. Chris or Judith, do you have anything else? Yeah, just quick, quickly, um, and then I'll let Judith go. But I just want to remind everybody that this facility is guilty of em emitting heavy metals, poisons, um, heavy metals are products of incomplete combustion um, into the air, into the water. Um, and also has, uh, you know, uh, been, been responsible for toxic uh, silica containing dust coating, you know, the neighborhood adjacent to, to Norlite for decades. I just want to remind everybody of how serious this is and that, you know, that we need to take action. We need to close this place down until it can be run safely. It has never been safe. I doubt it can ever be safe, but I'm open-minded to that, uh, that possibility. And thanks a lot for your time today, everybody. So we thought the burning of PFAS chemicals was behind us. It's, it's obviously not. Um, because this needs to be investigated. There is still no evidence that it's safe to burn a triple F, even though it happened for two years here. And um, illustrating that is the city of Cohoes adopted a one-year moratorium prohibiting the burning of PFAS for a year. The Albany, the Albany County Legislature passed the Clean Air Act, which prohibited this burning. And thankfully, Governor Cuomo uh, signed a bill prohibiting the burning of PFAS at Norlight. It took him five months to sign the bill, but he did. So we have local county and state policy validating that it is not safe to burn this material, but we're not out of the woods. Uh, Norlight today is violating their air permit. They are emitting over 50 pounds of mercury every year uh, that they, um, the DEC says they're allowed to emit 50 pounds of mercury a year. They're emitting more of that. We learned that from results of the test burn. Uh, we'll have more on that at a later date. I wanna put 50 pounds of mercury into context. One gram of mercury can contaminate a large lake to the point that it's not safe to consume the fish. So as we sit here today talking about PFAS, uh, the facility is out of compliance with uh, environmental regulations. Thank you. Thanks, Judith. Thank you, all our speakers. Um, if I'm gonna play a short three minute video to sum up all the information we just presented and if there are any questions after that, we'll stay as long as needed, so. Um. 
From the moment the news broke that Norlite LLC had tried to incinerate two and a half million pounds of highly toxic AFFF firefighting foam filled with carcinogenic PFAS chemicals, despite the presence of a site monitor, the question arose, when did the DEC know? Was it when Norlite signed a secret contract with the Department of Defense in 2017? Was it when the burning occurred in 2018 and 2019? Or was it at the end of 2019, after the incineration, as DEC informed many news agencies in the spring of 2020? Today, February 10th, 2021, we are closer to an answer, as you'll hear in a moment. The Cuomo administration has left many clues that something wasn't right. First, just as it had in Hoosick Falls in 2016, the Department of Health turned a deaf ear to calls by area doctors to test the blood of residents of Saratoga sites and the neighborhoods around Norlite. These residents remain untested to this day. Second, when in early June, the legislature unanimously passed a bill banning incineration of PFAS at Norlite, Governor Cuomo kept the bill off of his desk for more than five months. And then on November 9th, a story broke that Cuomo was trying to gut the ban bill. That news may have pressured Cuomo into signing the bill on November 24th, but it also provided a hint that the DEC was hiding something bigger. The story included the first statements by Joe Hattersbeck, the DEC's permanent on-site monitor at Norlite. Hattersbeck stated in so many words that he had not only known about PFAS incineration at Norlite, he had supported it. Hattersbeck's statements also suggested he has almost no scientific training or background and was not qualified for his position. These are all things that made it into print before today. But here are two things you didn't know. First, on November 8, 2020, the day before the ban bill story, DEC Commissioner Basil Sagos and his chief of staff, Sean Mahar, made at least two preemptive calls, one to Joe Ritchie of Saratoga Sites which you'll hear in a second, and another to Judith Enk, former regional EPA administrator. Sagos and Mahar had learned about the story in advance and were trying to do damage control. Like Monitor at the Norlite facility has not made statements that he was aware prior to 2019 that the facility was processing for a problem, but never alerted anyone in the department at that time uh, or subsequent to that, uh, or subsequent to this week, uh, that he was aware of that. Um, so again, part of our openness and commitment to you to be transparent, we wanted to let you know as soon as we learn this information and, and let you know that obviously this is not something that we're taking lightly. Um, we can't comment too further because it's an ongoing personnel matter now and, you know, but rest assured, you can know that we're obviously not happy with what we've now learned and we're taking immediate action to address this so it's not a mistake that we're taking lightly at all. Yeah, I, I just want to make clear. Sure, junior staff, uh, you made a mistake, didn't tell anybody until 2020. Um, but that doesn't mean the bus can stop with me. It's my agency. Um, I run it uh, well and closely, and it should have been dealt with this long. So uh, we're going to fix the issue with the monitor and ultimately put some direct connections in place. And you know, this kind of thing is going to happen again. But, uh, we want to make sure you heard from us directly, and we own it. <clears throat> We're going to fix it. This recording shows that Sagos and Mahar tried to paint Hattersbeck as a lone wolf, and they stated again that no one at the DEC knew about the incineration until 2020. But thanks to a FOIL request, we have copies of emails that tell a different story. Though the longest of the four emails in this thread was completely redacted, these emails still clearly show that then Region 4 Director Keith Gertz, handpicked for the job in 2014, was fully aware of and participating in the PFAS incineration at Norlite by March of 2019. These emails also show that Victoria Schmidt, Region 4 Materials Management Engineer, knew about the PFAS incineration, and that Gertz was in direct communication with Prince Knight the Environmental Regulatory Compliance Manager of Tredetti, and also with Sergio, who is almost definitely Sergio Nusimovich, 
president and COO of Tredebe USA. All of this throws DEC's most recent actions into question. In January, the DEC downplayed a hazardous waste fire at Norlake, even though Norlake has no valid permit to operate at this time. The DEC also immediately challenged and discarded studies done by Dr. David Walker, a noted geologist from Columbia University, who showed that Norlite's aggregate product, which is a known cause of silicosis, was blowing into the Saratoga site's housing complex and endangering human life, and that it has been that way for the last 40 years. And finally, DEC has yet to release any of their findings of their study of PFAS contamination around Norlite, despite the fact that the tests take only weeks to complete and the study began in October of 2020. Okay, um, any further questions from the press? We can stay on as long as needed. Um, again, so we are taking a look at foreign policy just one day after President Biden was nope. inaugurated. Hold China on. announced sanctions on 28 Americans, many of whom were part of President Trump's administration. The list includes- Oh, sorry. Any questions from reporters? Yeah, it's 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 me again. Um, so there was a there was a part in there where it uh, you're talking about the the five months it took to do the A triple F, and then uh, it went to the city and state article, and you said this is part of a larger picture. I'm just wondering, are, was that in reference to um, any claims that there were collusion, that there's collusion between the DEC and the Cuomo administration? I, I don't understand your question. DEC is part of the Cuomo administration. Yes, but they're, oh, yeah. they're not supposed to direct political uh, policy. No, no. Let me explain the five months. So the, thanks to hard work by assembly member John McDonald and Senator Neil Breslin, they got a bill through the New York State Legislature. Uh, it was voted unanimously uh, to stop the incineration of the toxic firefighting foam at Norlite. And they don't send, the legislature typically does not send bills over to the governor for his review until the governor asks for the bills. So we had a very long five month wait before the governor requested that the bill be sent over. And right after the city and state and New York Focus article ran, just a few days later, the governor signed the bill into law. But that, that is, um, that is, typical procedure in, in Albany. Um, what is not typical is having this serious health issue and having a five month um, waiting period before the bill was sent over. But the culture in the legislature and with the governor is they send the bill over when he asks for it and he has to ask for it by December 31st in the year that it was passed. Okay. I've done I've done a lot of research here um, going back to like the 1970s and I've noticed that um, a lot of the same complaints that go on within Saratoga sites seem to be um, uh, a lot of the same like the same uh, complaints seem to radiate over time and they really haven't been solved. So what what is the connection with the AFFF um, uh, symptoms per se, rather than the other symptoms over time uh, that people have had at Saratoga sites. Do you mean health symptoms or do yeah. you mean- Yeah, health symptoms, because it seems a lot of the same things seem to um, have gone over since, um, I mean, the 1970s. Well, Joe can speak can speak to that, but I'll just say that exposure to PFAS chemicals is significantly different um, because of the toxicity of the chemicals and our belief that a tremendous of that amount of the PFAS chemicals became airborne. 
Yeah, I mean, I just want to say, you know, I've actually met people who have, um, I'm not going to say their names, but who live in the area who actually are developing very rare reproductive issues that typically don't happen. Um, issue is we've, we've pretty much begged, we've begged the Department of Health to come in and to investigate this problem, to do blood sampling, to do some sort of biomonitoring, to see what's happening. Here, are, here we are to this day, almost a year later, nothing's happening. People's, I, I'm going to keep saying this, people's health are at risk here. And these agencies seem to only care about procedure, politics, image, rather than my mother's health, my grandmother's health, and my neighbor's health. It's a shame. Yeah. And I just had a quick reaction actually to that video as I watched it again. You know, through that, uh, and Dave really said it too in that film, um, but the commissioner said that they only found out in 2020. So when you have a constantly changing narrative, something's not right. Any lawyer would know that. And I'm not a lawyer, but if you tell your mom, oh, well, I did it this time. And they tell her again, oh no, I actually did it then. And they tell her again, she's gonna be like, wait a minute, you're lying to me. Your story's changing. It's just a classic, classic example of a liar. Yeah, just with respect to the health issues, you know, it, there needs to be significant studies done, but they're not being done. Um, so, you know, the, the, the exposures that people, you know, that there is documented evidence of repeated exposures to the same types of, you know, problematic um, chemicals, uh, you know, poisonous, toxic, uh, uh, toxic heavy metals, um, products of incomplete combustion, silica dust, um, for going back decades. It's, not, it's there's no doubt that this is causing, you know, health problems in the, in the community. But it's not being studied, and every time we ask uh, for those things to be studied, where it's dismissed, it's explained away somehow uh, that the that the residents uh, in the nearby area are, are are unlikely to be exposed at significant levels. We we call we call BS on that. We we need we need these things studied. Um, we need the support of the New York State government to come in and, and, and look at the the residents and go back and do a real retrospective history. Uh, to, to establish that, that public health, um, that epidemiology, um, you know, uh, linkage to, to human health in the area. Uh, without that, we can only, you know, go by the precautionary principle that, that, that when something is, it has the potential to cause harm, it probably is. Um, so, so the assumption should be that, you, you know, this is not a court of law, um, a criminal trial. Uh, they're guilty until proven innocent. If they're admitting all of these compounds that are known to have adverse health impacts on, on humans. That's my personal and, and uh, uh, scientific opinion. Uh, I, I really, you know, we're, we are imploring DOH to do biomonitoring. We've asked again and again, have been, have been um, uh, you know, rejected. And, uh, you know, those, those key epidemiological studies going back decades need to be done. So we're calling for those again as well here. Mm. And just kind of my last my last question on that note, is there any is there any hope now that there might be a bigger watchdog um, uh, within the change of, of uh, governmental administrations um, now that the EPA has uh, some different leadership um, than it did before? We hope so. Thank you. Peter Mantius, did you have a question? Yeah, with the blood tests um, for PFAS uh, at the housing facility, um, you, you mentioned that the, you've made some efforts to uh, talk to the Department of Health. Are there, are there letters or in, in what, what, how did you make the appeal to them and what, what specific response did you get from them? Well, I mean, this is yeah, go ahead, Joe. say one thing. I mean, it's on the record. They've recorded their yeah. public sessions from the DEC. We've, re we've requested that at the public sessions. Um, we've had parents cry because they're scared for their children's health at this kind of facility living here. And we've received, no, we're not going to do it until we have the procedural evidence to suggest this. We gave yeah. them a study and they conducted the same exact study. So I don't, I really don't know what's happening, but they're not doing any kind of study right now. With, re yeah, with respect to biomonitoring, we put in writing back, I think in September, and we can provide you with a copy of that letter. Yeah, I'd request love to, to have that to have that done. 
and they did respond verbally in a in a DAC info session um, why they they thought it was inappropriate to do those studies. Uh, again, I would reject the the premise uh, you know on which they they um, declined to do those studies. Well, as recently as last week, when the Department of Environmental Conservation in the city of Cohoes had a public information meeting, um, there was a representative from the Department of Health on uh, Dr. Michaels. And the question just less than a week ago was posed. And she said, until there's evidence that there's been exposure, they would not consider doing blood sampling like they did in Hoosick Falls of PFAS chemicals. What's astonishing about that comment is that Norlite burned over 2 million pounds of uh, AFFF containing PFAS chemicals. What more evidence of exposure do you need? Uh, Bennington College did do a study, not a study, a, a series of samples um, showing uh, PFAS presence in soil and surface water near Norlite. Within hours of those samples being released to the public, DEC dismissed those sample results and attacked the Bennington College researchers who did it. Um, the good news is DEC decided to do their own sampling, uh, essentially the same way the college did it, using the same lab. Those, sample, um, those sampling events happened in October of last year, and here we sit in mid-February. They still have not been released to the public. I don't know what the delay is. We were told by DEC last week that they don't want to rush their scientists. At the same time, we know that the passage of time, the presence of PFAS chemicals in your blood goes down. Unfortunately, not enough and not quickly enough, but the time for the health department to have done the study, I would say would have been March, 2019, when a top DEC official knew that the burning of PFAS chemicals was happening. There's no reason for delay. Peter, um, I um, so I'm I'm Dave Pablo. I was the person who put together that video. I've also done some interviews uh, on this with multiple sources, including uh, Dr. David Carpenter, who I interviewed uh, in December, I think it was, and that interview is available on SoundCloud. I'd suggest that you check that one out because I did ask him what he thought about, you know, the delay by the Department of Health or the Cuomo administration or whoever you want to pin this on. And he said that one of the things is that, you know, they may be waiting this out um, uh, because as Judith just said, uh, the human body will, you know, cleanse itself of uh, PFAS chemicals, but the damage is already done. Uh, you may not see the results of it until many years later, but the damage is done. It just becomes harder to detect uh, or impossible to detect. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that seems to be uh, the DEC and the Cuomo administration's mantra. Um, if you don't test for it, you won't find it. And uh, it's really reprehensible. I just want to correct one, one slight thing. The only way PFAS chemicals leave your body um, in a timely fashion is when women menstruate or breastfeed. Uh, other than that, uh, it, it, it stays for years. I would just clarify that a little Either. bit. This, the smaller compounds that could be products of incomplete combustion do actually clear a little bit faster, but, but are, are thought to have similar toxicity. Uh, to the, 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 the compounds that are fed to the, the incinerator. Yeah, um, that's, so, that's, so that's, 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 I think that's a detail that Dr. Carpenter went into. Yeah, the short chain, yeah. Peter, Peter, I'll just say in response to your question, I wrote the, D, the, D, the Department of Health on uh, in July of 2020, laid out the case for testing and doing biomonitoring based on what we know including um, you know, information that was revealed in a federal lawsuit um, by a toxicologist and a chemical engineer about the incineration of, of uh, AFFF. And uh, the DOH wrote me back. And as I also pointed out that the DOH receives a significant amount of funding from federal leg legislation to do these exact types of studies on PFAS exposure. And the DOH wrote me a one page letter back basically saying that they trust the DEC 
over uh, the uh, the independent scientists who had done some testing and basically uh, uh, passed the buck, kicked the can. Um, but that that also those exchanges also ha uh, occurred. And if you want to uh, email me, I, I'd be happy to send you those letters. Definitely, I'd like to get get that exchange if I could. Well, are there any prospects for um, for having independent studies done, blood tests done? Um, even though they're they're um, they're they're somewhat dismissed by the by the state agencies, um, sometimes that can serve as a prompt to get the state agencies moving. Well, it's very expensive. It's very expensive uh, to test for PFAS chemicals in human blood. We need the state health department to do that. And I might point out that um, there's been a tremendous amount of work done by independent. Uh, efforts. The Bennington College sampling of the PFAS in the soil and the water was dismissed within hours. Uh, usually what it results in is a responsible agency saying, thank you for this information. We're going to look at it very closely and then decide if we want to test further. Eventually, the DEC got there months later. And then very recently, Dr. Dave Walker um, retired from Columbia PhD, world-renowned geologist, did a tremendous public service by taking the dust from Joe Ritchie's car, testing it and identifying uh, quartz glass uh, that in the dust samples that either come from volcanoes or norlite, and we're willing to rule out volcanoes. There are none in Cohoes. Um, the DEC response to that information uh, included that quartz uh, is everywhere. Uh, they're, they're looking at it now. Just late yesterday, they announced um, six uh, enforcement actions related to dust leaving uh, the, the, pro the property. The news release did not say exactly what they're going to require or what the fines and penalties are. Um, but you don't need to be a rocket science to know that giant piles of fine silica material uncovered is going to blow off site. Thankfully, Dr. Dave Walker did what DEC should have done years ago. And if you go to the DEC webpage, you will see a 30-year rap sheet of environmental state law violations that go on page after page that document these problems. Joe Ritchie called DEC when there was black snow uh, near the playground at Saratoga sites. Um, just 20 years ago, um, just July 13th, the year 2000, there was a similar problem with black snow at Saratoga sites and DEC assessed a penalty of $3,000. So it's pretty obvious what's going on here. This is Norlite just deciding this is the cost of doing business. They'll pay the modest fines and continue to pollute the environment. Yeah, I would just add to that, Peter, that, that um, you know, it takes tremendous resources to get these kinds of studies done. And so citizen scientists, it, it's a very difficult prospect to, to, to conduct those, those types of studies. But Judith mentioned cost access to equipment, um, all of that, all of those things. We, we don't simply don't have the funding. The state has tremendous resources. Um, one of the best department of health research labs, in the, you know, in the country um, and is, is refusing to do this, this, this really critical work, um, despite the fact that we have this, this track record, this rap sheet that Judith points to. I would add that there are non-overlapping fines that you can find from the EPA um, on, on other incidents that, that weren't uh, enforced by, by DEC. So the, the, the history is long, repetitive, and uh, you know, reads like uh, you know, Bill Murray and Groundhog's Day. It's, uh, it's, it's just clear um, that, that, that you know, we need to have you know, epidemiological studies. We need to have testing, biomonitoring. There is a small group of scientists that are, that are, are trying to get to, together the resources to conduct those studies independently, but really the right answer is to have you know, the, the state do the, these studies. And I know that the health department is very, very busy with responding to COVID-19, uh, but these problems have exist, existed for years. And I think actually the response at this point now is Norlite needs to be shut down. Uh, the state agencies are either unwilling or unable 
to protect public health and regulate this facility. 30 years of ongoing violations is long enough. That concludes our press conference today. I know there's another really important press conference happening uh, about the residents of Glen Falls. Um, so thank you all for coming. Again, this video is posted at facebook.com slash media sanctuary. And um, any further questions, please just email uh, Mark Dunley or myself. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thanks.